So this is our second podcast, and again we're going to kind of talk about Jordan Peterson because I think increasingly he's becoming this kind of lightning rod for the culture wars. Like he's he has become the paradox that we talked about before, like a man who's talking about overcoming polarization and speaking to people you don't agree with is becoming the most polarizing figure probably in the world, certainly in the intellectual world right now. Um, And it's a fascinating phenomena in its own right. And it also just, I think, works as a kind of um, lens to look at a lot of deeper social dynamics. Yeah, I know, I agree. And I think the last week or two, um, well, since the last podcast came out, have been almost a microcosm and, and maybe even a speeding up of, of that dynamic and, and Peterson maybe taking on a different cultural role. Um, so as a journalist, I think it'd be interesting to hear from you in terms of obviously there was a New York Times article uh, and there was the uh, PC debate as well with, with Stephen Fry and others. Yeah. Um, starting with the New York Times article uh, and the response to it, from a journalist point of view, uh, first off, what do you make of that? My sense is reading it was one, most of them were his own words. It was a very, um, a friend of mine said it wasn't a hatchet job, it was a stiletto job, which I thought was a brilliant way of putting it because it was all just very subtly done. And it was. And the irony was, and I do think, like so far, I think Peterson has been quite lucky in his choice of opponents, like the Kathy Newman interview. Channel 4 put up the whole, new, whole interview unedited. He, he came out of that interview thinking, wow, they're going to cut this up and it's going to make me look terrible. They put the whole thing up and he was shocked. And speaking of someone who used to work for Channel 4 News, I don't think they realised what they were doing when they put that up there. And I think if they could have taken it down, they probably would have done. Um, but that worked in his favour. I'm not convinced, and I think it might be quite easy within sort of his bubble and the bubble of the sort of Peterson fans, of which obviously I'm kind of, I am one, but I like to try and think, uh, I like to think that as a journalist I should, I'm able to kind of look at the, the bigger picture and see both sides. I think that one has done serious damage because I think what it's done is crystallised views on both sides. The reaction that I saw afterwards on Twitter and the reaction that I saw afterwards on social media was gleeful on one side look we told you this guy was a misogynist we told you he was regressive and this proves it and so it's interesting i think to look at what's behind the polarization and i even think the term peterson fans is interesting every time i hear it i kind of have a bit of a twinge of like what because you know i see myself as a fan of the truth you know and i think a lot of people who who are you know deeply inquiring into ideas would probably see the same thing and peterson is popular because He's been speaking an awful lot of truth. Where do you think the polarization is coming from? What the left is hearing with Peterson is there are these biological realities, there are these things, and that means these things are fated to be the case. Male and female gender roles are fated to be the case. These things are fated to be the case. This is what they're hearing from him, and that's the huge reaction, because it's like, are we going to have to roll back to the 1950s? I don't think that I I don't think that's the natural conclusion of what Peterson is saying. What Peterson is saying is there are certain immutable truths about our biological existence that we need to acknowledge. I was in Austin at the Voice and Exit Festival and Brett Weinstein was there. And he in his talk he said we we understand that we are not blank slates. And for a long time, the left was hoping that we are blank slates because then we can, create the, we can create the world that we want and there are no restrictions and we just socially engineer it until we've got this perfect world and that's what the left wants to believe. Not true. Clearly not true. But Brett said, we may not be blank slates, but we are the blankest slates around because we're adaptive, because we, we are as successful as we are, because we are able to be adaptive. So biology is not fate. And this is a key point that I think can get us to the other side of this polarization. At the moment, you've got the left effectively freaking out over what they're hearing from Peterson about like biological realities and all of this stuff. And I think this is a problem. I think Peterson is not 
helping because he is not making that case clearly. And I don't know if he believes that or not. I genuinely don't know if he does actually think everything since the 60s, men and women working together, all of this stuff might be a, an error, might be a, an experiment that can't work and, and we will end badly. So if he is being misunderstood, that's partly his fault for not sketching out that actually there is a place on the other side of this, which is we recognise the fact that we have a biological reality. We recognise our evolutionary heritage. We recognise that men and women have different skills and adaptations to the world. Yet, we can use this toolkit to do something different. And as a, it's another taking another sort of line out of Brett Weinstein's um, thinking, if we don't evolve past the toolkit we've been given by evolution, we are going to extinguish ourselves. Because also in that toolkit is hardwired tribalism. And we're seeing, that, we're seeing that play out, like the social media has made all of this worse. We are seeing all of these sort of different temperamental camps pulling into like isolation. And as Jordan Greenhall said, this is an extinctionary level threat that we're now in armed camps around each other. And everyone's kind of picking up on this in this polarization. But there is, and Peterson unwittingly is feeding into that polarization because he is not making that other leap beyond, yes, there is this scientific reality that everyone, that is not, that is indisputed in the scientific literature. It's only the sort of bias of the, of the mainstream media that kind of doesn't believe or doesn't want to accept all this stuff. But he is not pointing to the deeper resolution. And that is crucial. And it's like, it's like this idea of reviving your father from the underworld, which is a central mythological idea. It's like we have to rediscover and reanimate the essential truths of our culture. That's what he's saying. Like the Logos, lived out truth, aligning oneself with the truth, all of that stuff. But that's going to look very different now than it did in prehistory. That resolution, we're not going back to men and women in, in completely separate spaces and all that stuff. We've started an experiment in the 60s that we're going to have to see through. But we're only going to be able to see it through, and I think a lot of this underpins like the gender dynamics and the problems with Me Too and the, the way that men and women are kind of also polarizing, mm -hmm. is to recognize that polarity and recognize that reality and then say, and we move through. We move through it. We recognize that we have different experiences of the world, but, and we're not, equality doesn't mean equivalence, it doesn't mean sameness. We can reclaim polarity, but we can reclaim it in a conscious way that doesn't put one over the other. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that men are, men are superior to women or any of the stuff that, that are kind of, that has been part of our kind of heritage. Yeah, and I find this absolutely fascinating, this, this concept coming out of, um, evolutionary biology about your genes um, effectively having their own agenda, self-replicating themselves, being, you know, selfish, so to speak. Um, and, you know, hearing Brett Weinstein talk about it, it, it immediately made me think in terms of kind of a global solution and that next step. It is like the way the ego can be con conceived of phenomenologically when you do inner work. And it's what you know Eastern traditions have been talking about for a long time. When you look at yourself and inquire into yourself, there is, there is an ego there, which is in a sense a kind of machine that is designed to help you survive in the world. Self-replicating machine, it's got all of these drives that have yeah. very little to do with you. Very much so, yeah. And, and the Gnostics... Which also kind of maps onto the shadow idea as well. Yeah, it like does. The idea that we yeah. have these kind of programs that yeah. want to dominate, want to control, want to kind of to, to fight. We need to integrate those. Yeah, and the mistake, what we normally try and do is suppress them. That's what makes a shadow. It's like, oh, I don't have that violent tribalism in me. I'm a, I'm a good boy. <laughs> it's effectively where it comes from. And that's exactly it. And it leaks out. It leaks out, and you start projecting it outward. And you could argue that racism, uh, and Anne Shulgin has argued this, racism is the ultimate explanation of the shadow. You know, it's the ultimate way of seeing the shadow. It's like the otherness within yourself and everything you hate about yourself gets projected onto the, the other. Um, and it's a really fascinating concept because the ego is the object of the transformation. So it's a mistake also to try and kind of kill your ego because you need your ego. Uh, what you do is you transform your ego by taking a step back and looking at it, which is very similar to what Brett Weinstein is talking about when he talks about 
not being the slave to your genes, to be aware of it and go, hey, you know what? I don't want to kill or be killed. I don't want X, Y, Z. I'm going to be, um, I think, in a, in a video we're releasing, calls it the captain of my own ship. This is my airplane, you know, which he takes from the movie Sully. This is my airplane. And that is, is crucial. And the only way, in my opinion, to get there is to really look at yourself and know how to do that and enter these states where you can really delve in and inquire. And ideally, doing that on a collective level or at least enough, of, enough people doing it. Is this, I mean, we touched on this in the last podcast, but it's effectively this inability to recognise that we all have this tribalism is what's created the reaction of, of Brexit and Trump. Like this liberal, this liberal idea of we're the good guys, we're tolerant, apart from those people who don't think like us. And that's, that's what we're seeing at the moment. It's like this shadow. And it's so easy to persuade oneself that we don't have a shadow. We are the good people. We are. And, and that because it, it's, it's coming from a deeper place. It's coming from this kind of... It's like how in alignment is, is, your, is your set of beliefs and your set of motivations and your set of not motivations but your your kind of intellectual center and your kind of reactivity center because it's very rare in this world to find people who have both in alignment we're driven by things we don't we barely recognize that's the whole kind of psychoanalytic insight is that we're not masters of our own house as again peterson talks about and um it's the other thing i want to kind of talk about as well is that this the IDW, the Intellectual Dark Web concept. So it was named by the New York Times a couple of weeks ago. I think even that has the danger of becoming another tribalism. Mm. Because the reaction to the New York Times article, I saw Ben Shapiro put out this really sort of castigating piece. I mean, quite rightly, the, the, the journalist had an agenda and it was, there, there was a lot to take on there. But uh, it, it's very easy for even the people in, in this sort of intellectual dark web movement of which apparently we are on the outskirts of, according to the website that's identified us as critical darker web, uh, which maybe means we're allowed to criticise them, I don't know. Um, um, like that can become another tribalism very easily because the whole idea, I think, for me, if, if the intellectual dark web is to become a, a genuine thing and a genuine force, has to be that there's some sense of... I mean, it, it, is, it is not homogenous... It, it, it's supposed to be heterogeneous. To, that's the whole point, is that people don't necessarily agree, but they, are, they agree to be able to have conversations. So I think it's important that people disagree within it or are allowed to disagree within it. Um, so I would criticise or at least question Peterson around a couple of things, one of which is this... Is this not seeing the place beyond the polarization. And I think also the way, and I can completely understand this, he's under unfair attack all the time. So he would have to be superhuman to not react in some way to that. And he clearly reacts. I mean, you see him on Twitter. You see him, um, I know of people who I think would be won over by his message who followed him on Twitter and stopped following him because they're like, this is, he's, an angry, he's an angry guy. Mm. And I know there was an, even a, in an article quite recently, I know he's been told if Twitter Peterson keeps coming out, then that's the end, that's the end of it. And, and you saw that in the debate just the other day in um, the free speech, the monk free speech debates. He was angry, he was tetchy, he... I mean, he was, he was again, un, completely unfairly attacked. The guy on the other side said, you're a, you're a mean white man. It's yeah. like... And Peterson, I thought, the words that he used, he dealt with it really well. He said, OK, you can call me mean, maybe I am mean. I'm probably no more mean than many other people, but why did you have to bring race into it? Which I think is absolutely right. It's like, why did you bring race into it? How would it have been if it had, if the, if it had been reversed? I mean, it's just, that, that's the, 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 the problem with identity politics all the way through, is like, it is essentially a divisive force pitting one group against another. It's, it's catastrophic. Um, but you saw Stephen Fry mm. just dealing with it with a level of wit and lightness of touch and humour, but firmness. And you just thought, wow, this is what it takes to get the other side. A bit of humour, a bit of lightness. And Stephen Fry actually said, he used the G.K. Chesterton quote, 
angels can fly because they take themselves so lightly, which is a fantastic way of looking at it. And as I said, this is, I, I am criticising, I'd like to think of this as constructive criticising because I, I think it would be almost impossible for Peterson to have reacted in any other way. If you look at the trajectory that he's gone through over the last mm. few months, the kind of levels of unfair criticism, the, the way that he's kind of come from nowhere to being this kind of centre point in, in the public discussion, it's almost impossible for anyone to, to ground themselves under that kind of projection and that kind of pressure and that kind of... So I don't... Yeah, I, I, want, I want to sort of frame it in, these are, the, these are where I see his blind spots. Um, and if, while I'm on this, I'd also say I think he's still kind of focused on a kind of student politics thing, that there are other things that he could talk about. Like, implicit in his work is the idea of that materialism as a doctrine, the idea of only seeing the world as made up of material things, has been a great impoverishment because we're not seeing ourselves as fully human and this is what we're seeing cascading through our culture. And I think if you started emphasising that rather than just emphasising the dangers of SJW culture and all this stuff, which is also true, then suddenly I think people would be saying, oh, okay, maybe he is an ally. Because I think he is an ally. I think, he, I think he's an ally for the left as well as the right. But at the moment he's, he's only being seen as an ally for the right because of his concentration on the excesses of, of campus culture and SJW culture. But actually, I think, he, I think implicit in a lot of what he's saying is, is stuff that the left is concerned about as well. He just has a different take on it. Like, in a, he talks about inequality. It's a, it's a huge problem. But it's a much bigger problem than the left realises because it's built into almost every system and we have to be able to deal with it. So there's an integration. Like, he needs to be integrated. And the reactivity to him almost without fail, I've found, shows something that has not been integrated in the person who's reacting. There's an envy, or there's, there's an envy of his success, or there's a inability to see him clearly, or whatever. So most of it is reactivity. But there is also, if we can integrate what he's saying as a culture, like this deep history of, West, of Western um, thought, and that is not only Western thought, because it precedes Western thought, it goes back to Mesopotamia, it integrates all of these other kind of much deeper wisdom traditions. Integrate that and move beyond. I think we need to move beyond him, but we need to integrate him first. And I've, I don't see many people able to integrate what he's saying. And this is, this is also a very interesting point you're raising, I think. So to get back to, the, to what you said about Stephen Fry and about the way Stephen Fry talked, and that kind of lightness. Um, I've, I've thought over the last couple of weeks that what's interesting is that, you know, in therapy it's very important to resource people, to make them feel safe in order for them to look at the parts of themselves that they need to look at to, to resolve a trauma or whatever it might be. And when they're in the Paris, when they're in the sympathetic nervous system mode, in fight or flight mode, which is where reactivity often comes from, it is very, very difficult slash impossible to get someone to change their mind about anything. So you need to get them resourced, which is kind of what Stephen Fry is doing. He's, he's creating a safety by being like, hey, let's not take it too seriously, like, you know, and there's a lightness. And so that is, I think... So you pull out of the... Of the you pull out of the conflict, and the, the, if your goal really is to move beyond polarization, I move towards a kind of um, yes and, um, even if you disagree with someone, then I think that's really important. And I have absolutely no doubt that Peterson can do that extremely well with you know, two odd decades of clinical practice. I just think it's probably extremely difficult or impossible to do it with thousands of people shouting at you every day. It, you know, On both sides. On both shouting sides. at you, you're the, you're the best thing since yeah. sliced bread, and that you're yeah. a fascist. Yeah. And, and so where Stephen Fry probably naturally does it is because he is a performer and, and a very witty man as well. He is a performer. And, there is, and so the irony of what I'm about to say <laughs> is that for all of the left's um, focus on tonality in the way people communicate things, there is something to be gained from that because the way you say something doesn't change the intellectual merit or the logic of what you're saying, but it certainly changes how it's going to be received. 
But it also does change what you're saying. How so? If I, because if I say, hello, or I say, hello, <laughs> yeah. that, those are yeah, two different actually, things. That's a good point. Those are two different yeah. things. Yeah. I mean, the idea, like, the medium is the message. Yeah. It's the, the idea that this kind of bizarre, slightly autistic, often male insistence on, no, it's just the fact. It's like, no, it's not just the facts. It's like the way that you say something communicates almost more than the stuff that you're saying. So there's this kind of bizarre insistence, and you see it a lot. I, I get into a lot of those arguments online, mm. um, where someone is saying, you won't engage with what I'm saying. It's like, it's because the way you're doing it shows that, one, you're wedded to a position that means there's no point in me engaging with you, because you're just trying to prove yourself right. Why would I get involved in a conversation with someone who's just trying to prove themselves right? And I can pick that up from the emotional charge with which you're coming forward. Mm. I'm thinking of someone in particular. I won't <laughs> mention their name. But because he's so obsessed with me, he's going to watch this. Um, <laughs> um, and yeah, but it's like if you're coming with this kind of obsessive quality or then it's like I'm not what's the point of engaging with you? There's no way. You're just, it's not an open inquiry. The, the conversations we need to have, and that's again coming back to the whole intellectual dark web concept, is the conversations we need to have are beyond reactivity. They're beyond trying to prove ourselves right. They're genuine inquiries into where is this person coming from? What has this person got to teach me? I may not know something crucial. That's, and that, that's tied into the emotionality or otherwise of the way that this is delivered. He, I think, is going to have to recognise some of the reactivity of what he's bringing. Because if he doesn't, he's going to continue to... It's like what you, what you resist persists. The idea that the force that you're putting something out into the world will meet an opposite, an equal force, by definition. And if he's coming from a slightly... I mean, he's one of the most integrated guys around like he's really integrated his shadow he's got his anger working for him he's got all this stuff but there is a reactivity mm. and that's why some not all because I think he would create polarization anyway mm. but some of the polarization I think is coming from that now this is our second podcast we're introducing a new member of the rebel wisdom team this is Raffia Morgan who um, I'll embarrass him by by calling him the best facilitator I've ever worked with a very, very wise man who is going to give us some of his wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> Let's yeah. see what comes. Yeah. We've concentrated a lot on Jordan Peterson yeah. because for me, what he symbolizes is the potential reintegration of the sacred into a society that I think have really lost its way in this kind of materialism. And it's kind of has cut, a, cut us off from a really deep part of ourselves, the religious, the mythological, the spiritual, all these sort of ways that we, yeah, we used to make sense of the world and I think speak to something really deep in ourselves. And th this is, yeah, what, was your fir what were your first thoughts when you encountered Peterson? I mean, we're, we're going to go on to, because at the moment we, we're kind of reflecting on where his blind spots might be. But just to start, what, what did you get from Peterson at the beginning? What was your first kind of experience? Well, I started listening to a lot of quotes which you were frenetically sending to me. And I was like, what? There's a really intelligent voice out there who's addressing some of the main concerns, things that are affecting my life, questions that I've never been clear about or had answered before. I felt like, Phew, I was impressed guy's done his work and, and from the sound and feel of it, he's taken the tough path. And that suddenly he had a voice was kind of exhilarating for me. And I really hoped that he was maybe the, 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 the cutting, new cutting edge of a synthesis of a lot of the stupidity that's been around forever basically a lot of the polarization of the right and the left and the incapacity to talk and that there is somebody who gets the bigger picture and can weave this whole thing in a way that would address you know real life concerns for lots and lots of people so uh, 
very enthused and I've used quotes from him um, in my groups, particularly um, he, the work that he does and talks about integrating the shadow, I feel has been, uh, had a direct application in my groups, let's say, and he articulates it extremely well. Yeah. My sense is that it would be almost impossible for him not to have had some kind of, the way he's attacked, I mean, he's unfairly attacked again and again and again and again. So uh, he would need to be superhuman not to have some kind of reactivity to that. But, I mean, we went to see him at the Hammersmith Apollo the other day. And for the first half an hour, he was kind of railing against the left and railing against the people who'd, um, who'd kind of been mistreating him. And I just, it just felt unnecessary. It's like you, you've kind of you're at this kind of intellectual superstar level right now and, and it seems to be getting to him in a way that is unnecessary and also I worry is just creating more of the same polarization that he's trying to get us past. I really wanted him and really hoped that he was going to represent something that kind of left the reactivity of the right and the left behind and started to offer something that was just so intelligent. And I think he's capable of it. And I sat in the crowd and when the railings against the left came, they, my, my respect, my energy level, my attention span, my enthrallment, my feeling of being in the presence of a really strong um, intelligence, let's say, went right down. Because there it was, there was the personal stuff that was coming out that hasn't really been worked through. You know, yeah, he got screwed on the New York, New York Times article. It was a hit job. And he was, he was going to lose his job for a long time back last year. I mean, he's been... Yeah, and he's, you know, and, and he's had the... Gut, and, and so on one hand, I love that he stands up and he creates polarity, like between masculine and feminine. He talks so intelligently about that, and I think it's such an important thing to come out of the, you know, the liberal left, you, you know, the, all the postmodern, everybody's the same kind of crap. You've done an awful lot of kind of work with, with this kind of stuff. What happens when you put out that kind of reactivity? What, where does it come from and what does it create in the world? Well, it's always, we have to say, everything that I have a strong emotional reaction to inside myself is informing me something about myself personally. It's not an objectivity. There's not a clarity there. There's a strong emotional charge. So it requires inquiry. Why do I have such a big charge there? Go into it a little bit, Come, become a little bit more responsible, and please save us from the blame game. Because it just, it just immediately drives things down familiar old canyons that we know don't work, and it's not what's needed right now. We need, we need Jordan to rise to his best. And that means he has to be a little bit more media savvy, sorry, needs to work on his own stuff like everybody else. He can do it, he advocates it, and maybe not go on kind of overly simplistic tours. Because I had that feeling when I saw him that I was part of, even, even from the introduction to the whole thing, it, was a, it felt a little bit contrived to me. I didn't wake up feeling inspired, and I feel inspired by him yeah. often. Well, the, the bit that, that really resonated was the Q&A at the end. The Q&A? The Q&A felt yes. natural. The, the, the delivery of the talk w w felt like a sort of yes. Six old hits. in the last week. Yeah. Um, and it's a shame. I mean, there's two things that I would say, one of which is that I feel a cert also a, a similar kind of disappointment because... He's carrying the hopes, and I know, I'm sure he takes this, um, like he realizes this. Um, he's carrying more than his own fair share oh. of the burden. He, like he's carrying the burden, he's going to these debates with Sam Harris. I mean, the, he's, he's carrying a sort of flame for, for this reintegration of the sacred, for this great tradition of Jung, this great tradition of all of this stuff that has to be, I have no doubt, has to be integrated for us to move forward. We have to get past like this sort of naive materialism and naive scientism that someone like Sam Harris represents. It's like where religion is stupid and everyone else is stupid who doesn't think like it. It's just, like, come on, grow up. Who, the arrogance of that is just ridiculous. Yes. 
and he's carrying this. Like he's carrying. He is the kind of the hero at the moment for this this other way of looking at the world. I mean, there was a debate that he did with this guy Matt Dillahunty that I'll maybe try and show a clip of here, where he pretty much everything that I saw said that he pretty much lost that debate. And part of it was his body language. He was kind of over like this and kind of just, Matt Dillahunty was leaning back and kind of very in control of it. And, and Peterson was, was leaning over and he seemed peevish and tetchy and never quite completed what he was trying to say. And <laughs> I admire the guy probably as much as I've admired certainly anyone in the public eye for a long time. I've put up, put in some ways some of my sort of personal credibility behind supporting him, making the documentaries. and. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's quite hard to see that happen. Um, I, I'm just curious, do you think that he's just bitten off more than he can chew right now? Is he, is he trying to spread himself too wide? I think that he maybe has internalized that he's on a solo mission when he doesn't need to be on a solo yes. mission. Yes, yes that there are people trying to do the same thing as he is trying to do. Like the idea of re rescuing your father from the belly of the whale, the idea that we have to integrate our culture to move forward. I know a lot of people who are on the same, that same... A lot. Yeah. Really and, a lot. And he's gone, I mean, the, the impression I got when I met him in October in his house was he's come from sort of academia and a fairly small pond and he's now this kind of huge figure. And, yeah, and I, I worry that he, deliberately or not, is not taking in the right advice at the right times. And just seeing that this thing is bigger than him, this thing is, he doesn't have to do it all alone. And there are other people out there who can help with, with yeah, the mission that we all kind of, yeah, in, in our own way, like the same mission that, that we're on with Rebel Wisdom. It's like, this, this is the time. This is the time where we need to integrate all of this stuff because the way things are going at the moment, the polarization is increasing, there are existential threats, and things feel very fragile. This is what we're doing. Yeah. And Rebel Wisdom is about integrating the great ideas, but also integrating the emotional reality, integrating the deeper sort of embodied reality of what needs to happen because all of that needs to happen at the same time. It can't just be an intellectual exercise. Yeah. And of course, it tends to go that way with him. By his personality, he seems very, very dry. I recommended recently that he needed a night together with us sitting in the backyard barefoot, <laughs> just talking and hanging out. I just felt he was, he was on edge, and, I, and something in me was like sank inside yeah. a little and bit. Felt... It was like he's burning his pit, and they're after him. Yeah. He's an easy mark right now. I there. felt that. I mean, I hope that he is getting good advice. Um, and because I, I felt the same thing. I felt for a while that most of the criticisms of him were unfair, and I still think almost all the criticisms of him yeah, are unfair. I agree. But there is this other level of you don't look like you're enjoying it. <laughs> so you don't look like you're enjoying it. And I. This is the other thing that also there's, there's kind of, I think what, I'm pretty sure that in, uh, underneath this, like we've got a lot of Peterson fans who watch our stuff, I reckon some of the comments will be sort of saying, yeah, you're just bringing in like, he's, he's just masculine and you're just bringing in this sort of feminine, touchy-feely stuff and da 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 which it's like, no. Yeah. People will say that and, you know, it's just bullshit because, you know, I know for us, Rebel Wisdom and the, the, the way we're talking and looking at things is we're doing the work and part of that work is that we're going in and we're facing our own shadow sides and we're, sh and, and we're exchanging our feelings and the outcome of that is it creates a grounded sense of masculinity that has feelings. Yes, men also have feelings. Hello. You know, we do, and they're, they're personal, and there are certain collective aspects to them, and they're absolutely necessary for a communication that's going to be effective in this world. And we always, when we find ourselves in a strong 
reaction to something, we turn that inquiry back here because there's always something inside that's trying to come to the light, come to birth, trying to be, um, inform us. And I use my own reactivity all the time to look at myself. It doesn't bring me into uh, a feminine space. It brings me into a relaxed, confident male space. And I just feel Jordan recently is just showing some things around the edge where it feels like he's, you know, stop before you, before you burn down the whole city just because you got really reactive about something. Yeah, you got hurt. You're getting hit jobs. You know, um, you're being misunderstood. You're being misinterpreted. You're threatening as hell. You're controversial. You're right out on the edge. It's going to come back at you. You know, but have some place where you go in there and you just don't try and just outthink. And in that outthinking, come to some kind of blame because blame doesn't work. Blame registers as a kind of weak response. Show up and and show up inside yourself and and work through that reactivity, and it will make a huge difference in what comes out of his mouth if he does that. Because mm. I've thought this before. It's like he says. It's all implicit in the stuff that he's talking about. The idea that people don't have ideas, ideas have people. So this reactivity to the kind of SJW types, while understandable, can we not find compassion for people who've been kind of sold a, a pup in terms of their, their view of the world? You've been duped. You've been duped, you've been and misinformed. We, yeah, misinformed. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we can do that, and we can, and we can, and we can have a certain compassion for that, and we can show that in the light that doesn't have to be waving a big torch, you know, against something else. We need a bigger vision that is more inclusive, and that is not giving up, taking a stand. It's taking a stand for a higher vision that is more inclusive, that is willing to look at the right, that is willing to look at the left, that can find some kind of synthesis out of all that and stand for that and address the real issues and not just get lost in the kind of uh, name calling polarity stuff that's been going on forever and it's just so tiring. One last thing I'd like to say which is I have a sense just having gone back from America, uh, the Voice and Exit Festival in, in Austin, I don't think they are going to be able to find that, or I think it's going to be very, very difficult for them to find that sort of place beyond the polarity in America, because I think everything's so polarized, they're so split. I have some hope that that could happen in the UK, that we have more of a, of a civility, we have more of the humor which is able, is able to kind of diffuse these conversations, and also that we, the talent for the UK is for synthesis, like we're, we're very good at synthesis in music, in comedy, and like, that's the essence of creativity is taking stuff from here and stuff from here and stuff from here and putting it together. Like, that's the essence of the British creativity. I have a hope that that conversation can happen here and that's what I want Rebel Wisdom to be able to do. Yeah. To be able to have that conversation, hold that space of beyond the polarization and the integration of all of the sort of the other, the other stuff at the same time. Yeah. And I hope that can happen. Uh, me too, very much, and I agree with you that this is a place of synthesis and a lot of times the dawning of the first things, and if there's a clear enough message that comes out from here, it will catch on in the States. It's not like everybody is so in their camps, although I think in general the polarization is, is really, really great, and it's not, there's, a, there's a limit to the creative, creative kind of exchange that can happen. Everybody reverts to camp. So you've just flown in literally, I don't know, two hours ago, and landed in London from Austin, Texas, from the Voice and Exit Festival. Um, and we have a lot of really great content coming up from that. So what, what was the festival like? Who did you interview? How was it? So the Voice and Exit Festival styles itself as Burning Man meets Ted, which is true. It was... The, the production, the, the whole thing around it was brilliant. Like it was really, really well put together. So a lot of kind of techno-utopianism, blockchain, stuff like that, which 
I'm less interested in. Like I feel there's a kind of utopianism that doesn't really recognize the shadow and doesn't really recognize sort of deeper integration. But also they had the other side of it as well. Um, Brett Weinstein was there. Jamie Wheel was there, this sort of flow consultant. And we've got some fantastic interviews with both of them coming up. Um, and yeah, it feels like, yeah, it feels like we, uh, this, is, this is kind of what we're trying to do with Rebel Wisdom. It's like we've, we've done, we've had a, a big focus on Peterson because I think what he's bringing forward is of huge, huge value. And I also want to kind of expand and say these are the other people. Like Peterson's holding a big part of a, a really important puzzle. And there's other people in the intellectual dark web, for example, who are holding other parts of that puzzle. And there's people like Jamie Wheel who is holding the like embodied transformational flow state side of that puzzle. And I really, yeah, as we go forward, and that's why we're running the events as well, is that we're trying to give people those experiences of those flow states and those transformational experiences. Um, so this is, we're trying to give this sort of 360 degree experience of where we need to go individually and collectively and culturally. Yeah.